server stack got too hot. Gregory Dudek is a professor at McGill University and director of McGill's School of Computer Science. Dudek is an expert in robotics. His research deals with sensing for robots, including computer vision, and theoretical work on the complexity of robot localization and navigation. With his students, he's developed underwater and amphibious robots. Greg Dudek is a native of Montreal. So my, my work deals with essentially making intelligent systems, so com computational systems that have some aspect of intelligence. Some of them are intelligent systems that just sit on a desk and look at you and try to understand what they're seeing and maybe pick out the most important parts. Uh, some of them are systems that work on the internet and try to suggest things to people. For example, we've had for many years a system that recommends movies to people based on some model of what it thinks they're going to like and what they might like in the future. And a lot of my research, probably the bulk of it, deals with robotic systems. Systems where intelligence is embodied in some physical system. So for example, an, a robot air plane that tries to fly around and go to the right places, whatever that means, or a family of underwater vehicles that can swim, they can walk, they can move around underwater and take pictures, they can work with a person who might communicate them with uh, using gestures, or they might take pictures of the world and try to build a model of it to know where to come back to later to collect scientific data. So specifically, we work on, for example, a robot that can swim and walk, and it moves around in the water, can swim underwater with a person, without a person, take video, understand that video to some extent, hopefully come back to the same places it's seen before and take new measurements, and in some sense build models and kind of understand the world that it's in. So one of the things that started our work in underwater robotics was the de desire to understand underwater environments, and particularly coral reefs. And so we've worked with biologists at McGill whose, whose research, their biological research, is to understand what's going on on a coral reef and how fish, fish species move around on them. And so one of our motivating, uh, one of our driving forces was to build a robot that could move around on the reef, work with a person, and take instructions on where to collect data and how to collect data. Now our work isn't to actually build application-specific devices. So we're interested in understanding the basic robotics ideas that would allow people to do applications. We don't want to really do the applications ourselves, but one of them is understanding coral reefs. Another, for example, is looking at the bottom of boats and inspecting them, seeing where there are problems. Um, that could be used for drug interdiction. We had people in the U.S. who, who were interested in applications like that in, in Florida. Um, you might be wanting to look at pipelines in the water that transmit whatever they're sending and have some system that could go back there and inspect them automatically. So it's no exaggeration to say that we're going to see artificial intelligence and intelligent systems everywhere in our lives. And we see them now, you know, everywhere from our car to our microwave oven to our cell phone. And so the kinds of technologies we work on are the kinds of technologies that one would expect to see in many, many places. You know, the full-blown underwater robot well, you might use that for inspecting a coral reef, which is what we hope biologists will do, or looking at the bottom of a, of a ship of some sort that has problems or, or concerns. But some of the component technologies, systems that can look at pictures and analyze them for when they're interesting or unusual or important, that could be used in security cameras, it could be used in organizing your photo albums on, on, your, on your desktop computer, it could be used in your camera itself. Um, so there's a huge range of things. Some of our work on modeling people's tastes and preferences that we use in our recommender systems, I mean that could be used in almost any system out there on the, we on the web where you have to buy stuff and shop for things or need to find information. When, when you talk about robotics it's hard to mention things that are going to surprise people because science fiction has raised our awareness and our expectations so high that in fact one of the issues is that the things that we can really deliver in robotic systems or mechanical systems is often kind of a downer when people first think about where the research is. But when they think about what they have in their lives today versus what they're likely to get, I think people are often pleasantly surprised. You know, it's not unreasonable to think that pretty much every device that you've got in your life that's mechanical or electrical is going to have some intelligence in it. And every one of those devices is going to be able to somehow do a little bit more than it can. From the elevator that's going to schedule where to go, to the microwave oven that's going to tell you exactly how stuff should be cooked and sort of do everything for you, to your fridge, to your car, to your, you know, your vacuum cleaner and, the, and your security system in your house. And really, like, some of these things are not very far away. So one of our projects 
deals with looking at photographs or video footage and finding frames or pictures in there that are unusual or interesting. We call it the vacation snapshot problem because it's the problem that when you go on holiday, you have to solve. You don't want to take a small set of photos and somehow mail them back, send them back, show them to people. And that problem of finding interesting pictures, you know, audio clips, things like that, it's everywhere. You could imagine that if you've got cameras in your house looking for burglars, that's a time when you want to look for unusual stuff. And you can imagine that if you're wearing a webcam on your shoulder, as some people already do, that's a place where they just want to collect the interesting moments of their day. And so there's a lot of that kind of stuff coming. I mean, in the next two years, it's pretty easy to predict that things in the next two years are going to be kind of like they are today, but everything's going to be a little faster, a little smaller. There's going to be a little more intelligence in everything. Where things are going to be in five or ten years, I think, you know, really, I think there's almost nobody who can predict that kind of stuff accurately because generally speaking, our ability to do 10-year out predictions has been very bad in almost any sphere of science and technology. But one thing you can say for sure is things are going to keep on changing. And, and our role in terms of making decisions and running every little piece of our lives is probably going to get smaller. Now hopefully we're going to, we're going to still deal with the cream, right? All the really good problems and decisions and issues in the world will be dealt with by people and all the crud will be de dealt with by our smartphones and our cars and our telephone systems and our smart house and things like that. But I mean, it's sometimes a little worrisome, not because bad things are going to happen, but because change is sometimes just in itself scary. So I think it's probably true that the computer world, if we can call it that, the information world, hasn't really given us a lot more leisure time. But it's probably changed the kinds of things we do. And I think it's reasonable to guess that we're probably not going to get that amazing leisure time back because if nothing else, we're going to be connected to so many people. I mean, I, you know, now through Facebook and all these other kinds of media, I can talk to hundreds of people every week. And so that kind of keeps my calendar of things to think about and things to do very, very full. But maybe that's not a bad thing. I mean, I think the, the world where we all sit back on our couches and turn into giant uh, uh, jellyfish, maybe that's not really the world we want anyhow. Maybe the world where our brains are totally filled with all the exciting things we're thinking about, that is the world we want. I mean, you know, having a career in research is kind of the best thing anybody could ask for. Because in some sense, to be successful in research, you have to love research. And so you're basically paid and rewarded for doing the stuff you love to do. Um, you know, when I get home from work, I uh, sit down, I have dinner with my family, and then if I'm lucky, I get to do some more work afterwards as a break. It's the best thing. And it's, it's great because I think you can move between several spheres of activity too. You can think about just kind of wild ideas and entertain yourself, or you can really solve hard problems, or you can work with students and help them do some of those things. And each of those three activities is kind of different and really great in it, on its own. So, you know, one of the wonderful things about the, the research life, if we can call it that, is that it's extremely diverse. And I think there are many different models, and it's not a sort of one-size-fits-all kind of world. Uh, so it's very hard to generalize, and, and each student is a bit different, too. But I think to do good research, certainly persistence is important. You know, you can't be persistent in the face of a bad idea, but, but getting your good ideas to come to fruition really involves sticking to them and sort of working through a lot of, of you know, potential hardships or, or, you know, down moments. I think also it's important to sort of enjoy the work you're doing. And I think to be successful in research, you have to love the problem you're working on, partly because you're going to have to go through those down moments, but partly it gives you the vigor and the excitement and the engagement that you need. And so finding a good problem is super important. And I think for most grad students that, that kind of comes automatically, but it's an important step in the process. You know, one of the surprising things to me was to get a, to take a set of ideas or a, a stream of research and bring it all the way through to a technology startup was a much longer road than I expected. Um, and it's it's you know, thank goodness I had the support of the Canadian government, the Quebec government, and McGill behind me to kind of get all the way down that road because there were a lot of little steps and uh, and it would have been very easy to kind of just get distracted and going to this other neat idea instead of, of following through. So so that was you know that was kind of an eye-opener for me, but, but it was a very good experience to go through the whole thing. If we wanted to make this cheaper, what do you think we could do to the case itself? 
Like, obviously, this increases the cost, right? Yeah, this fancy heat sink uh, obviously does. And the stuff on the inside, too, right? Like, all the ribbing for the uh -huh. pressure. Uh -huh. You know, so we've had a little bit of success with technology transfer. And, and I think it has been good to have support that let that happen. But I think there's a worrisome tendency these days to push that a little bit too hard at the governmental level. And I think that, you know, interesting ideas and interesting technologies even need a certain amount of creative energy and a certain ability to kind of look at interesting problems that haven't been tapped before. And, and I think if you push too hard on moving things from the idea stage to technology transfer and development too quickly, then you can kind of lose, lose the ability to come up with a really you know, off the track, unusual, um, unexpected ideas. And those are often the ones that have the biggest long-term impact. So I think if I could speak to government directly, I'd say, you know, maybe don't push too hard in that direction because you could actually, you know, to use a cliche, kill the goose that, that laid the golden egg. I think the history of science shows that a lot of really neat and really important ideas have come not from people who wanted to commercialize something or quickly transfer to industry, but were just kind of playing around. And that's a little bit scary from the point of view of somebody giving out funding because you have to, you know, buy a lot of lottery tickets that may not ever pay off. But that's just a necessary, I think, a necessary part of the game. So doing robotics is great for two reasons. One reason is that you get to start with things that are purely ideas, purely theoretical, carry them through to a software stage, some sort of implementation, and then finally see them instantiated in a real physical system that moves in the real world. So that's wonderful. And of course, it also shows well, which is, which is a nice benefit. So that's one great thing about robotics. Also, because it goes all the way from pieces of software and almost theoretical ideas deep inside the robot, all the way to physical mechanical systems moving around, there's a lot of issues that have to be dealt with, getting it to work in real time, deploying it out in the world. And in the case of the underwater robot, students have to go swimming or you know, scuba diving with it underwater. So there's a lot of logistics that has to come into play. And it makes the work, in some sense, much harder to execute, and in some sense, much more rewarding, too, because you have this entire, you know, when we go do a field trial outdoors, it's almost like a military operation. Um, and lots and lots of pieces have to come together, and when they do, it's fantastic. Sometimes they don't. In, in some of our early experiments, we had people on a boat looking at a monitor, a TV monitor, you know, controlling the robot or sending messages to a team underwater, and some guys, you know, watching this TV monitor for two hours. And you can imagine that if you're sitting on a boat, rocking at sea for hours watching a TV set, bad things are going to happen. And so, you know, our dive team, team comes up from underwater. I come up, I talk to the people on the boat, and they're all screaming at me, get down, get down. And meanwhile, there are fish jumping all around. And I realize I'm, I'm swimming in the, in the um, well, the guy on the boat basically got sick. And, uh, and so, I, of course, I went back down again. But, you know, so, so there are these strange experiences one has sometimes.